written to a man by the name of Philemon, and Philemon had a, was a wealthy man, and he had a slave by the name of Onesimus, and Onesimus had stolen from him and then had ran away to Rome. Now Philemon, we know, was a man who Paul had led to Christ uh, while he was ministering in Ephesus in the city of Colossae, and then Onesimus, he ran away to Rome, but God was waiting for him there, and he came to Christ while in Rome, and Paul was in prison there, and he sends uh, a man by the name of Tychicus, along with Philemon, back uh, to Colossae uh, with this letter, and it contains Paul's uh, instruction on how to handle a very, a very touchy situation. So um, we'll, we'll be looking at the issue all through the book, but this morning we're just going to pick things up. I entitled our series Philemon uh, Restoration and Redemption. Restoration and Redemption as there's many wonderful tools and truths on these two topics. And we all need restoration. We all need redemption. Amen. Well, before we begin, I want to pray, and then we'll get into God's Word today. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful to be here today. Thank you for the wonderful weather today. Uh, Lord, we know there are many uh, in our church, I think of Brother Nick and others who are battling uh, illnesses that are not here today. Bless them. Some are traveling. Give them safety. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the testimony of Brother Joe this morning, how you preserved uh, his material possessions, but more importantly, uh, his, uh, his life and the lives of those that he lives with there in the apartment complex. And we ask your, your strength on those who lost all the material possessions of this world. Lord, I pray their needs would be met and uh, most importantly, their spiritual need. But Lord, as we look into your word now, I pray your Holy Spirit would uh, do the work that only he does in illuminating and bringing conviction and encouragement where it is necessary. And may we understand your word better as a result of being here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Philemon, verse number one and two, let's look at it this morning. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, the, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So Paul, in these introductory verses, lists three people by name. He, he names uh, Philemon, and then most people think Aphia is a feminine name there in the Greek. It is probably his wife, uh, Philemon, his wife, Aphia. And then you have Archippus. Some people think Archippus was uh, their son. We don't really know that for certain. Other people think I would be of the opinion that he was serving at this time as the leader of the church at Colossae, the pastor there. And so Paul lists these three very influential uh, members of the church. But I think what we need to understand is we deal with the issues around Onesimus and Philemon and slavery and their relationship with one another. I found it interesting that, that God gives this letter where he names specific people and then he places those specific people in a context. And the context is, in the end of verse 2, and of the church in thy house. The, the, the context of this takes place in the local church. And the local church ought to be the place where restoration and redemption is part of the normative of what we do around here. That, that we take sick people and we deal with it. Now, i also going to say it's interesting that he writes this letter and addresses it to individuals. But then he also says, and to the church in thy house. So he wrote a letter that the whole church is going to know about. Now, this is a very delicate balance and one of the most difficult things that I deal with as a pastor. Sometimes public sin and public problems need to be dealt with publicly because it really minimizes gossip. Paul, this issue, I bet everybody in the church knew about it. So Paul, since I think everybody in the church pretty much there was common knowledge about it, Paul addresses the letter and says, let everybody in the church know what's going on. Now, let me say in, in balance to that, that one of the problems some churches have is they make every problem in the church a public problem. I know others in my fraternity that make the, the very drastic mistake, and maybe you've been in churches where the pastors have the audacity to call out people while they're preaching in a sermon about what their problems are. Now, sometimes I'll mention people that have problems like DT. I mention his problems all the time because they're in the supply. Um, and my wife will say to me, now make sure you tell people how much you love DT. And we might have visitors there and they think they're gonna, you're going to do that to them as soon as you find out their problems. And I say, well, I'll never run out of DT, so that's the first thing, so I'll never get to them. But I, if I pick on folks publicly, understand that it's because I feel a confidence that I can do that with them. And if I ever do that to you and, and you don't have that, please rebuke me afterwards and I'll apologize to you. I don't mean to. All right, do you hurt your feelings? I... <laughs> Sorry. 
I don't care. I <laughs> but it, so there's this balance here, all right? You know, you don't need to make every single year problem. It doesn't need to be church business, all right? But there are times where it needs to be done and needs to be said, and everybody knows it anyway. And so there we find that balance. But nonetheless, you have Philemon, who's mentioned, and he's this wealthy guy. Most people believe the church at Colossae was meeting in his house. When I say house, he probably owned a, not only a house, he maybe had what we might call a warehouse. He may have had a big banqueting hall. He just had bigger facilities than everybody else, and that's why they met there um, and used it to start and house this church. Uh, most people believe that Paul, uh, with the help of the church of Ephesus, that they had planted this church. And remember, the church at Ephesus, when we studied our Revelation series, was, a, was probably the most missions-minded of the early New Testament churches. Matter of fact, I have a map for you. I'm, I'm a map guy. I like to kind of know where I'm going. You know, like on a racetrack. And here, uh, you see over here, I didn't bring my little pointer up here this morning, but you see uh, Laodicea and Colossae right, right over here. And you see Ephesus right there by the Aegean Sea. And you got the Mediterranean. And you know that, you, you know that part of the world, right? Uh, it's present-day Turkey is over here. And much of our faith really goes back to these areas around Greece. And you got Corinth over there and Achaia. And that's where Philippi and all that was at. But Ephesus was so strategically located. And they did such a wonderful missions job there at the church at Ephesus. So this, this city was pretty much right down the road uh, from Ephesus, and most people believe that Paul uh, was very instrumental in the founding of this church. Now, as we saw, the early church met in homes. It really wasn't until late second century, early third century that you started seeing churches meeting in, in separate buildings. Uh, many would say, and I would be of the opinion that most of the time, churches were kept in the house because there was such persecution that they couldn't go publicly and worship. And that's what really confined them uh, to a house. Uh, but remember, it isn't the house that makes the church, right? This is a church in the description, but this is not the church, right? It's people who are believers in Jesus Christ. If you've placed your faith in him and been baptized in Christ, we are the body of the Christ. We are the church, right? Yeah, you know that. So we, basically, it's not all of us coming to the church. It's all of us individual tabernacles, uh, all of us dwelling places, all of us individual churches. We come and we meet corporately together. That your worship every week is primarily directed not by when we all get together necessarily like this, although it is necessary, but what you do with your temple all the rest of the week. Now, some people get get all to do about you know, and there's a big movement out there called the house church movement. Now, I don't think it's wrong to start a church in a house. I don't think it's bad to have a church in a house. All right, don't misunderstand me here this morning. But I know some folks that feel like they're really not part of the New Testament church unless they're meeting in houses. You ever have been told that one? Well, we meet in houses because we just feel like the church just got away from whatever it is, okay? Um, I always like to be a fly on the wall in some of these house churches. Not all of them, all right? Many good churches started in a house, all right? I'm not, don't, I don't understand the balance. All I'm trying to say is just as this building here is no more the church than, than, the, than if you meet in your living room, all right? It is not the, the physical structure in the New Testament that makes up the church. It's people who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, okay? So I want you to see that balance. But I would ask you, would you like to start a church in your house? Yeah, I'm not getting, I'm getting a lot of no's and I'd appreciate your honesty this morning. I mean, what if we all said, hey, let's wrap up church now and we'll go to the Sam and Cam's place where we can play with the goats and chase ducks or whatever else y'all have out there, crazy things, or we'll go to Brock and Lori's and ride around on the golf cart and run into trees. We've done that out at their house before, you know, we can do, you know, and we all went back to your house right now. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd like everything y'all would want to, you know, we, We'd want to get home a little before you guys got there. You know what I'm talking about? You imagine uh, the kids from the nursery coming out in the middle of the church service. Hey, look what I found in Mrs. Tadola. Well, okay, we'll leave that there. Um, you get what I'm going. Now, Paul brings the, the, the context of the local church and says, we got to solve this restoration and redemption problem in that context. And then he lists or he mentions these three individuals at the front and he gives us some descriptions about them. As I read these verses, I said, you know, it's wonderful how God chooses in his sovereignty and in the inspiration of scripture that he gives us a wonderful picture of what are the key ingredients of a local church that leads a church to be effective in, in restoration and redemption. So I'm going to share with you this morning uh, three elements to the believers and the church. 
church, all right? Number one, notice he says that they were beloved believers. They were beloved believers. Notice he says, Philemon are dearly beloved. In verse two, and our beloved Aphia. Do you know the Christ-like church should be characterized by love, shouldn't it? It should be. Not saying it always is, but it should be. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, a new commandment give I unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Now, this is not easy, is it? Yeah, sometimes the hardest people in the world to love are your own family. Again, I won't take testimonies this morning, but in your biological family, those are the people on the one hand you want to just the most, but on the other hand, they're the people that in the hard times, ought to be the ones that are there for you, right? Church family's not all that much different. You know, sometimes we irritate each other. We do things, you know. I have to have the Alabama section and the Auburn section, and then there's the righteous section where the Florida fans sit. But we have to sometimes divide so we don't get, you know, little, little skirmishes in the church over stuff. But, but uh, we're commanded to love one another. You see, the Bible teaches that the moment you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, says, To the praise of his glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I personally believe he's talking that we're accepted now in the beloved who's Christ, that we're in Christ. And again, these verses are dealing with the blessings of election, not election to salvation, but election to blessing and calling. And God chose, he elected that anybody who would come to faith in Christ would experience the wonderful blessing of being accepted in the beloved. Why? Because we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That God, by his gracious act, chooses to accept you in Christ because of Jesus' finished work. You see, if you don't understand that you're accepted by God, you're, you're going to go around asking everybody else always to accept you. You're going to have to have every other human being, oh, I got to have it. No, if you really understand your relationship with God and that you're accepted by God and you're loved by God, it, it'll radically transform your relationships with other people. Yes, sometimes love does mean confrontation or correction. Even God says in Hebrews chapter 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son he receives. So if you're loved, you know, that doesn't mean that God's not going to correct you or that inside the local church, someone may not rebuke you. We just need to remember that if we are the one that God is saying, go rebuke that person. Don't you like that job? <laughs> I want to go tell that person exactly what I think. Well, as soon as you say that, don't, okay? Uh, you're not in the right spiritual mindset. But, but when you lovingly go try to correct someone, it's not so I can get revenge. It's not so I can say, hey, look at how I was right and you were wrong. It's to edify them. And by the way, be careful what you choose. Now, we get all tied up on things that are really secondary issues. Uh, I thought of Ephesians chapter 4, um, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning of craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to see. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head Christ. In, in other words, he's saying, you know, don't be this immature Christian that's all over the place in, in doctrinal issues. So he's not talking about, because you don't like the choice of their, their uh, hairstyle, or you don't like the choice of the car they drive, or you don't like the choice of where they sit in the auditorium or whatever. That's, that's, we're talking about doctrinal issues that relate to their relationship with Jesus Christ. And there you should speak the truth in love. You see, people, believers, we are beloved. And Paul uh, like to use this term frequently when he described fellow servants and churches. He says in Colossians 3 in verse number 12, isn't a great verse, put on therefore as the elect of God, you know, because you were elected to this position of blessing, you're holy and guess what else you are? You're beloved and put on the bowels of mercy. Now that's an old King James word is a great word. It simply means, you know, the bowels is your inner gut, you know, from the, your inner gut, your, your insides, you should be merciful and kindness and humbleness of mind, and meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So he, he's admonishing us to, as a beloved individual, to forgive and show loving kindness to our brothers and sisters in Christ. All I'm telling you is, if you don't understand your own love relationship with God, it's very difficult to do that. Very, very difficult. You show me a marriage where both individuals love Christ and are and know their position in Christ, you can develop a, a loving marriage.
but it's very challenging when that is absent. You see in Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 9, remember the book of Colossians written to the church at Colossae? This was right in the context of Philemon. Paul mentions Onesimus, the runaway uh, thief. He said, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. When that was read at the church of Colossae, that must have been like drop the mic kind of moment. What? Who? Onesimus, he's what? He's beloved? Praise God, there are no slaves in Jesus Christ, is there? I, I believe that, that, that was a, a, a moment. And I got to tell you, Paul writes his letter to the church at, at Colossae and to you and I today through the book of Philemon and understanding if Onesimus was ever going to be fully restored, he must find a church that is full of love. You see, some people in the church are really good at demonstrating this and some people are more gifted than others. You know, but I, I love some of you guys that, and, and girls here that uh, are, are, are really good at sharing love, that you're the kinds that, that text or call when someone is missing or when you find out someone's having a problem, you, you, you get in contact with them or you get up and you go over to their house, you, uh, you, you send cards, you send flowers, you, you make meals. You're, you're the kind that, that if the person wants a hug, not everybody wants a hug. All right, I'll get my amen for my anti-hug crowd, but uh, you know, you're the kind that come up there and give someone a hug. You're the, you're the kind that are, are quick to weep with someone who is broken and to laugh with someone who's laughing. And the church ought to be a place where that kind of reception is not the exception but is the norm amen i'll say amen to it the church ought to be a place of love you see love is the supreme ethic this week i i got a couple cards um, i got one from cody and erica and they sent us a wonderful card our church uh, they just had a, a baby another grandchild for brock and Lori. it's a really cute little baby it looks more like Lori, so it's cute um but Cody and Erica sent a wonderful note in thanking us for the blessing that the church was. She says, I'm so thankful for the car seat, the stroller, the formula, wipes, the clothes, and everything else. We are absolutely blown away by your generosity. I love the car seat, stroller combos. It's easy to use and so handy. I use it all the time. Also, your timing uh, in the gift of the, of the formula showed Cody and I that God will provide. We are so blessed to call you all our odd family. We hope to see you all soon, Cody, Erica, and Selah. Amen, isn't that great? Got another one this week also from our cancer ministry, the BBC ministry. Uh, cancer ministry sent and met a need in someone's life. And we got a message from Jean and Sharon Taylor. And they say, dear Pastor Sedola and Open Door Baptist Church, we want to express our appreciation and thanks to you and the Braxton uh, battling cancer uh, for the 64 bottles of, of medicine and food that you sent to my husband and for your prayers. She says, you will never know what this has meant to us and how we deeply appreciate your thoughtfulness. May God bless you, uh, Gene and Sharon Taylor, John 3.16. This is what the church ought to be about. And I pray that folks come to Open Door Baptist Church, that they find a church that is made up of beloved believers. Number two, not only beloved believers, but ought to be laboring believers, laboring believers. Notice in... in uh, Verse number one, he ends it, Philemon, our dearly beloved, then calls him our fellow laborer. You see, love, genuine love, real love motivates service. Don't sit there and tell me you love someone if you're not in any way serving them. Amen, wives? <laughs> Dirty dishes at home, guys, you can do them, all right? Mow the lawn. Uh, that I think love and action at some point become inseparable. Now, it doesn't mean you don't love someone if your actions aren't totally the way they ought to be, but it will say that your love is not what it ought to be. We love and we serve what we love. Again, Paul uses this term a lot to describe uh, faithful believers. He uses it in Romans 16, 3, where he describes, uh, um, oh, who is it? Priscilla and Aquila, my helper, same Greek word, in Christ Jesus. He says it again in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are laborers, there, same word, together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, that we are the church. And so there are servants in the church. I don't know about you, but I like Martha's in the church. You've heard me defend old Martha and Mary. You know, Martha, Martha, you're cumbered about with much serving. <laughs> My problem is most Christians would be, Martha, Martha, you ain't doing nothing. What do you think makes Jesus a little more angry? <laughs> 
you know, at least Martha was doing something and that we, we studied her life and I think she figured some of that out. But I personally believe that her spiritual giftedness was serving. And I'm so thankful that in the local church that if it's going to be a restoring, restoring, redemption kind of place, it's going to take people that, that using the abilities and the capabilities they have at the time of life they're living in to serve God, to serve in the local church. These are the people that clean the kitchen. These are the people who mow the lawn. These are the people that paint the building. These are the ones who make and serve meals. These are the ones that work in the nursery. Uh, these are the ones that change dirty diapers. These are the ones that are Sunday school growth group teachers, Awana workers, junior church workers, work in the audio vi video section. These are people who love to come to church work days. Church work days are their favorite thing. They love it because they love to serve. You see, these are people who always have others and their needs in mind and are always willing to to help now, I'm sure I left some things out in there so if I left your area out please don't be offended at me go back to point number one I love you okay <laughs> I'm just saying it takes a lot of things to get done to make a church operate doesn't it and and understand that we all have a responsibility to witness we all have a responsibility to be restorers and inside the lo local church though sometimes our giftedness is different and sometimes I have people come and say well pastor all I can do is mow the lawn don't say that ever to me okay now I'm going to be nice to you and everything but do you know how important it is that our lawn looks maintained? It looks like we mean something with our, with our property, that we're good stewards over what God gave us. Is that not important? And I would argue, you know, you guys say, I just want to work in the nursery. We need more nursery workers. Matter of fact, if you want to work in the nursery, see Jennifer. We need more help uh, in, in those areas. But it, it, it's not easy. And sometimes it's thankless. And sometimes you're putting up with someone else's child. And you're sitting there going, if you are my child... Yeah, we know how your child is. The rest of us are thinking the same thing about you. But nonetheless, um, all these areas are essential, and sometimes the, the bigger picture gets lost. You see, o Onesimus was not only going to need a loving church, but he was going to need a helping, serving church. He was going to need what it is to be free in Christ, to, to no longer be identified as a slave, but now that I'm free, but that didn't mean you sit on the sidelines and do nothing. You need to get involved in serving. And by the way, you never really get fully discipled for Christ until you get busy serving Christ alongside other believers. And the local church is the context for that. That doesn't mean all that work is necessarily done here. Sometimes our church ministers and goes out and mows lawns to people and shut-ins, or sometimes we're at drive-in ministries property. Some, who knows? We're, we get out there, amen? Work. You see, nothing easy was ever accomplished without hard work. Your spiritual life, your marriage, your family, your finances, all the same principle. Number three, and I'm done. Not only were they beloved believers and they were laboring believers, but they were fighting believers. Archippus our fellow soldier. Notice that in verse number two. He's the fellow soldier. Now, Archippus, we believe, is the leader of the church. And here he is, probably a young, newly put in pastor. And he has to deal uh, with a very big issue. Probably got the memo, hey, the Apostle Paul is sending you a letter to the church at Colossae and one to Philemon that he wants you to read in front of the whole church. Uh-oh. Um, can you imagine when all the parties involved and, and Onesimus shows up and Philemon and Aphia and the church family all show up? This is must-see TV. This is where you want live streaming for sure. Amen? You know, what's going to happen? This is why I believe, by the way, if you read in the book of Colossians, again, this is the context for the book of Philemon, but in the book of Colossians, verse number, chapter 4, verse 9, Paul says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Do you, do you notice the, the tone in that, that verse, the admonition? He basically said to Archippus, you've been called to do a job, now do it. And I believe probably the greater context was, you're the leader of this church, you've got this conflict between a very significant member, a wealthy member, and, a, uh, and his family, and this runaway slave, and we got to deal with the slavery issue, we got to deal with the theft issue, and, and the church issue, and, and, and I can imagine archers might just say, hey, let's just try to put this on the back burner, let's, let's, let's you know, maybe, maybe somebody else can deal with it. Paul says, no, 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 you have been given a, a position of authority, deal with it. You know, ministry and the church ought to be about dealing with real issues. Real issues. Now, it's one of the reasons people don't, they'll come and visit. 
and why people don't like to get faithful to church, why people don't want to be accountable to church, because they know churches like this one, when, when issues, whether it's between each other, whether it's between in your own family, and they get to that level, that, that, that we're going to deal with it. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, when I was a young pastor, really zealous, I don't care what the problem was, I was on it, you know, because I, I tend to be confrontational. And I had to learn that sometimes you do need to wait for God's timing and let God work before you're just running in there and telling everybody what to do. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying there's not time for patience and long suffering. There is. But that's different than just sticking your head in the sand and pretending it's not there. And in your life, there are issues in your life right now. Then, and, and you know what they are. I, I don't know what they are, but you do. And if you're having a significant issue in your life right now, if I were to ask you to write it down, you'd know what it is. And, and you're making a decision right now as you sit here this morning, what you're doing with it in your life. Are you just saying, well, if I ignore it long enough, it'll go away. No, it won't. If marriage ain't what you think it ought to be and you think, I'll just ignore it and it'll go away. No, it won't. Well, I got these financial problems. I'll just ignore it. No, it won't go away. Hey, I got this problem with this other person. Oh, no, it won't. Now you can run and hide and you can run away. And I, I'm not saying you, you can go do that. But you'll never be effective in serving God and doing what Jesus Christ called you as a believer to do if you do that. You see, leadership and ministry is not easy. There's a lot of battles. There's a lot of issues. You have to remember that these are all these restoration and redemption issues are spiritual warfare. That's why Paul in Ephesians 6, the famous passage of Ephesians 6, 12, admonishes, reminds us that, that, that all this, this warfare um, you, did I give that one to you, Allie? Did it freeze? Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take in you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You see, it's dealing with the real issue. Satan's trying to blow up your marriage, blow up your life, get you discouraged, get believers. He can't take them to hell, but he can make them ineffective. He can put them on the sidelines. Can, oh, you know, he, he can make some of the mistakes that you've made and just give you guilt all day long. And every time that you try to do something for God, Satan will remind you how bad you are. And you'll say, yeah, Satan, you're right. I'm awful. And then Satan gets the victory. And there you stay on the sidelines, you know, uh, all by yourself. No, no, no. The, the, the church ought to be a fighting church. The problem is we need to be fighting over the right things not the wrong things. We need to be fighting over real issues, not secondary and third dairy and four dairy uh, issues. I, I this week was reading uh, one of my favorite authors. I read a lot of his books, uh, Tom Rainer. He writes a lot of church survey books on why church grow, why they die. He writes, he's a best-selling author, okay? And I read a lot of his books and he, he had a, doing some research and he was on churches and he asked a bunch of people in churches to tell him what were some of the things they were fighting over in their church? Because he wanted to write a book, say, how do we help churches handle their conflicts? He goes, I was not prepared for what I got. Now, I'm not going to give you all of them this morning, um, but I'm going to give you some of them about, and these are real experiences from real churches in, in recent years, and this is what's going on in the church. One was, there was an argument over the appropriate length of the pastor's beard. Number two, there's a fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. Think about that. Tom Rainer says, I'm dying to know the resolution of this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here's one. One person sent in. They said, we had a 45-minute heated argument over the type of filing cabinet to purchase. Black or brown, two, three, or four drawers. Tom says, this was an official cabinet meeting of the church leadership. <laughs> he said there was a fight in one church was over, the, over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. Tom wanted to know. He said, I have no idea. I just want to know who took the pictures. All right, now think about that, all right? So don't get all offended about, you don't know, I don't know. There's one, there's a business meeting argument about whether the church should purchase a weed eater or not. It, to, it took two business meetings to resolve. He goes, wow, that was really wacky. <laughs> He's doing good, Tom. Your humor is good here. Here's another one. Two different churches. Two different ones reported fights over the type of coffee. In one of the churches, they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand. In the other church, they simply moved to a stronger blend and members left the church in the latter examples. 
over the kind of coffee, I don't like Starbucks, then don't drink it. He says, Tom says, the ones who left over the coffee, they went and started a new church and they called their new church the Right Blend Fellowship. <laughs> Gotta love it, huh? An argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs at the church meal. I wish I was making this up. Tom says, yes, you can, only if it's balanced with an angel food cake for dessert. <laughs> Two more and I'll, I'll stop. He said, there was an argument over... There was an argument over whether to have gluten-free communion bread or not. He made a very good point. Tom says, I thought gluttony was a sin. <laughs> I like that one. That's a good one. One more. There was a dispute in the church whether to allow people to wear black t-shirts since black is the color of the devil. Oh, that's what I said. He, he writes down, are you sure he's not red? That's what I've always heard. I've always heard Satan's red. Don't he? He's got the red coat, you know, so I... I, I don't know, but I, I wish I could tell you this was made up, but that's what our churches today are fighting over. You know, the, the, the problem is when you get more emotion and you have more feelings about the color of the carpet or something's happened to church or we bought a lawnmower and, and, and your emotion never gets stirred over lost people going to hell or marriages that are being destroyed, Onesimus who are out there who are bound in sin and slavery or dying to be restored to the body of Christ, but you won't lift a finger or a dollar or you won't spend any time praying or spending emotion to reach them, you got a problem. You have lost sight of what's really important. And many people don't attend church today because of a church business meeting. Because it was full of flesh and full of carnality. So we just don't vote around things out here. By the way, we just don't vote like that. We need a church. If we need a weed eater, I decided we need a weed eater and we get it. If that offends you, do I do it again? It didn't work last time. Find another church. There's a lot of them, okay? Because we ought to be about restoring people we ought to be about redemption you see it's difficult to make all this and deal with these big issues and it's difficult to love one another it's difficult to have the right fight it, it, it is difficult to labor and work hard and we close this morning i just want to kind of tie it all together by saying how in the world can a church ever do this because I don't know about you, but I live in this fleshly body that still wants to do the wrong thing, that still has bad attitudes, that still, and yet I want to do the right thing, and I want to live under the Spirit, and I'm trying every day to die to self and do the right thing, and it's hard. So how does it work? Well, I think Paul gives us the, uh, the, the, the key ingredients to making that work, and that's found in verse 3, and we'll end here for today and pick it up again next week. Paul goes on to say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, no church... It's my KCS quote for the week. No church can be effective without grace and peace. No church or ministry can be effective without grace and peace. It doesn't happen. Aren't you glad you're saved by grace? Unmerited favor of God. You didn't do anything to earn it. God freely offered it to you with no strings attached. As a love offering to you, he paid all the price. Simply asked you to turn to him by faith. This week, I got this this week in the mail at church. You say, what is that? I can't read it from there. Well, Tom, you can probably zoom in. You can watch it on the live stream later. Um, but the letter, the letter says, you know, dear Pastor Stadola, have you ever felt the stress of overburden in ministry and the needs of your congregation? Yeah. Helping your community can be a daunting in the face of widespread drug abuse, dishonesty, crime, and cynicism of today's world. Yeah. Well, I have good news for you. Aren't you glad there's good news? There are ways to resolve common problems that seem to have no ready solution. We can help. Interfaith activities help build strong communities. Enclosed is a free DVD to access our 19 tools for life online courses. Um, one does not need to be a Scientologist in order to benefit from information contained in these courses. They go on to say they are non-denominational, providing easy to grasp basic sensible solutions to difficulties so many encounter in life. So do y'all know what I'm, did, 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 did that register? The Church of Scientology, which is no church by any biblical definition, is sending helps to us 
Now, it's funny on the one hand, sad on the other, because many churches are not doing what he's trying to say here, or what she is, actually. I think her name is uh, Mariana Menendez. Mendez. But Mariana, I would simply tell you, you do not have any answers that can be built upon a firm foundation. Scientology may help the flesh reform the flesh, but it will not solve your sin problem against God. Because this is not grace, this is work. As a matter of fact, they, in the back they have a quote by L. Ron Hubbard. I don't have a good feeling he's in heaven this morning. Really. Dianetics ain't going to solve your problem. And yet, I wonder how many non-denominational churches, and by the way, I'm not being mad at non-denominational churches. If you're non I don't mean to pick on you necessarily, but I am going to a little bit. We're non-denominational because we don't want to stand for nothing. Often. Now, again, don't, don't, don't overreach this on good non-denominational churches. I'm just sharing you why I still like being a Baptist or I like my Methodist friends. I like my Presbyterian friends. They know they're going to heaven. You know, they've been chosen. But I like them, all right? I love them. They're brothers of mine, all right? In Christ. But I wonder how many churches are going to, oh, this sounds great. Let's put this on the church lobby. You see, there's no grace here. It's all about works. It's all about how you can empower you. That's totally antithesis to the scriptural way uh, to righteousness. It is not through what I can do. It's through what he did. It's nothing I can do. It's a free gift. See, without grace and peace, there can be no effective ministry. You see, Paul was about these dealing with real issues about having grace and peace. John Walvard said this, there can be no peace apart from grace. You see, first you receive grace. When you recognize you're a sinner in need of a savior, that you are helpless to get to heaven, your good works, your communion, your baptism, nothing in scripture says that gets you to heaven, nothing. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in, under heaven by any other name, only one name whereby we must be saved. Only in Jesus Christ is salvation. And yes, the scriptures claim that exclusivity because he came and lived the perfect life, satisfied the wrath of God, and he offers the finished work for you. You don't have to do nothing but simply turn by faith and believe and receive the gift that he's offering. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. You see, it's difficult for us to love one another until first we have grace. And by that grace, we have peace with God. I'm no longer under that judgment of his judicially. I'm now in Christ. But there's a difference between having peace with God, salvation, and the peace of God, which means living my Christian life, experiencing peace as the Holy Spirit of God produces fruit in my life. How do we do this? Boy, I'll tell you, it's a really, really difficult thing. Uh, to make a church work. I, I, I thought this week, and I'll close. I probably went long this morning. Sorry, Tommy. Um, too bad. Um, sometimes in ministry, you're privileged to meet some really, really wonderful people. And trust me when I tell you, and I think some of our board members, pastors, I don't want you guys pastors, any pastors here, other pastors, I know where Wilford is, but if you pastor and you're honest, you're going to admit that sometimes you're called to pastor people who know God better than you do and are stronger Christians in many ways than you are. Don't ever get under the illusion that just because I'm the pastor means I'm the best Christian here. <laughs> now, I, I better not be terrible at it. <laughs> but many years ago, I was privileged to meet these two folks. This is Hinton and Ruby Barfield. And they were members of our church in Florida and I was privileged to be called their pastor for many years. And I was also privileged. Uh, I think Brother Hinton went home to be with the Lord at uh, age 95. I think he was 95. Kelly, if he's listening online, I think he was 95. But I, I was privileged to do both uh, homegoing services for both Ruby and then later on Hinton. And it was one of the great joys of my life in terms of an honor uh, that they had run a race that was worthy. And they were just devout servants of the Lord, just had a tender heart. And I loved pastoring them. They had a hunger for God's word and they'd been serving the Lord for a long, long time. I have another picture here of a young couple. Guess who that is? That's Hinton and Ruby Barfield. Early on when they were first married. 
Isn't that something? Don't they look like this dapper young couple? Beautiful. Hinton and his tall, distinguished, you know, hats. They were attending a church on one side of town and were living on another side, and the local church said, we really have a ministry of a burden to expand our church. We want to plant a church on the other side of town. And one of my favorite stories that Hinton and Ruby used to tell me about, and they had three small children. Oh, well, they're not small anymore. <laughs> they're older than me, Kelly. That's right, you're older than me. Um, but there are three children, and they went to the leadership of the church and said, you know what? We'll start a church in our house. And they did. They tell me the stories, how it started out as a small group and the church began to grow. And so then they had to move the church part out into the carport. Now this is in central Florida, you know, so even, even if you're under a carport, if you've ever lived in central Florida uh, in, in about half the year, it pretty hot. You know, and they had their church out there and they said, then we took the inside of the house and made them Sunday school classrooms and nurseries. And every week, week after week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that was the old days. We had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, people met at their home. Year after year after year, the wear and the tear, the broken things, the things their people into, the, the hurts, the disappointments, and they just stayed faithful until the church grew to the point that it bought its own property. And then they put up a little lean-to. He used to tell me how they built a lean-to and they started meeting out on the church property under a lean-to. I'm sure the city zoning would not allow us to do that today. And then eventually they built a church. But eventually, sadly, in their later years, they had to leave the church because it lost sight of redemption and restoration. But I will tell you this. These are two folks that had a church in their house. They were beloved. They were serving. And they were fighting over what was really at stake. I remember them and I think of them frequently as a testimony that I want to finish my race. I want to stay at it and keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your teaching today and your word. Just a few short verses in the book of Philemon. I appreciate the faithfulness of your people and their attentiveness this morning. God, I pray if there's one here this morning that doesn't know that they're on their way to heaven, there's never been a time where they receive that gift. They may know about it. They may have information. But has there been a time they said, yes, Lord, I understand that you died for me, for my sins, that you were buried and that you rose again. And Lord, I'm believing in that. I'm having faith in you and your finished work and your offer of eternal life. Would you make that choice this morning by faith, my dear friend? How about it, believers? Boy, are you involved in the area of restoration and redemption? Are you involved in the context of the local church? Are, are you feeling unloved this morning? Or are you letting Satan get victory in your life? I pray whatever your need, you do business with God. Lord Jesus, have this time of invitation. Holy Spirit of God, do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.